think I might have asked, told you that it's recording. I hope. I hope it is. Um, so hello and welcome very much to um, our fourth um, Creative History in the Classroom event, where we're going to be looking at creative objects. And I'm really, um, really delighted to invite our participants to today's session. Um, I think it builds on some really great um, sessions that we've been having around creativity in the classroom and really actually showcasing some excellent um, innovations around um, creativity and around um, really some some um, original and exciting things that hi uh, historians and historical subjects are doing around teaching our subjects to our students um, and moving beyond perhaps some of those more status quo or traditional ways of reading and engaging with the source material and also trying to think about communicating history more broadly. So just to let you know, um, Josh is going to be um, in the session and he's going to be live illustrating um, the papers as you go through. Um, and they're, they're wonderful. They're really brilliant. Um, so um, please do check out our, um, our social media afterwards because you'll be able to see, the, see these papers in a kind of more creative fashion than perhaps our um, usual prose style. Um, in the... Um, in the um, um, chat function, you'll see that I've put up a couple of notices, um, including um, the names and titles of the papers and the speakers. Um, I've also included a link to um, our, our link to our sort of web page that informs you about future events. So we've got uh, another um, session happening on the 14th of December about feeling creative, and we'll have four speakers um, at that session as well. Um, and then in January, just to do a bit of a plug, um, it's going to be our own hands-on um, session where we're going to be trying to think about creating a creative history manifesto and um, where we'll be asking participants to create a sheet and um, to go into a zine that will hopefully maybe start a conversation around kind of creativity in our subject area. So um, I just would like to let you know we'll be doing the papers they're going to be around sort of 20 minutes long there's going to be time for questions and the way that it works is that you can either ask a question in the chat function um, and I can read it out or alternatively you're more than welcome to unmute yourself um, and to participate um, that way. So our first speaker uh, I should have paid more attention to this I think is going to yeah is going to be Amanda so I don't know if you want to upload your slides um, and it's really I'm really grateful that Amanda's arrived because it's like 7.30 in Canada where she is so um, it's thank you so much for waking up early for us um, so that we can end our day talking about um, uh, talking about um, book history and virtual classrooms and um, the printed past. Um, there we go do we see that all right? Yes, I do, um, but do you want to just check that your slides can tap along because it, 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 it's the first alliteration that we were initially showing. Is it going back and forth right now? No. Of course. All right. we, were, we were only just saying in the whole session about how we were bemoaning, um, bemoaning teams. Is that, is it working now? Is there anything happening? No, no, okay. Um, what about now? Anything happening? I can't, I can't see anyone, so. Oh, no, uh, sorry. No, nothing is happening. And at the moment, I, it looks like it's just a PDF um, open. I'm going to have soup. That's all right. How about now? No. When you um, uploaded them the second time, it 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 came up slightly differently. So I don't know if you uploaded them through through um, a different way. Oh no, it's doing it now. Oh okay. So I just can't see you as all. But um, you know, if you scroll down, when you uh, when you shared this, sorry, um. Uh, when you shared it last time, it came up with bu bullet points and your slide is empty on the... Oh, yeah, it, it progresses. OK, brilliant. OK, I'll so let you move on. Sorry. Thank you. OK, so I can't see anyone, just so you know. Um, so if something goes wrong, you'll need to tell me. Um, all right, thank you very much. Uh, as the pandemic started, I developed a new module or course, as we call it here in Canada, 
by the book, A History of Publication Design, looks at 150 years, starting in the mid 19th century. It's a publishing course at Vancouver's Simon Fraser University for third and fourth year students from any field. The three challenges were one, teach to students who don't share common disciplinary knowledge. Two, discuss the look and feel of publications remotely without students handling them. And three, make history relevant to students today. I've taught the course six times, all during the pandemic. Um, four of those times have been asynchronously in Canvas. And did the slide progress? Do we have bullet points now? We don't have bullet points now. Try it again because it's really not going to mean much without the slides. Yeah, it's moved on to the third slide here. Buying oh, the no. book. Okay, now there. We're, now we're back on track mysteriously. All right. Um, this topic list is how I pitch the course to prospective students. From private press to propaganda posters to penguin paperbacks, there are multiple thresholds through which students can engage with a field that's brand new to them. Students come from across the uni from majors in econ to psych to dance. Most haven't considered the objecthood of the book. They've learned to focus on the text. My course teaches them to examine how the look and feel of books, magazines, newspapers, posters, and zines target audiences and shape their responses to the text. Some students will have industry careers in which historical knowledge will inform creative and strategic choices but most students will pursue other fields. This course teaches all students to be critic consumers. It's a 13 week course. We should see 13 topics now. Yeah, yep, we see that. Awesome. awesome. Uh, it's a 13 week course that's a history of publication design, not the history. We start in Victorian England, one in where many current publishing models were established. And we end up today analyzing how publishers leverage design history. And I should say that I'm something of an accidental historian. Uh, my mouth dropped open the first time that someone called me a Victorianist because I hadn't realized that I was. During my PhD in publishing, I developed a framework for studying what I call material evolution. I fell into history by asking, how did we get here types of questions about the present day industry. And that's the kind of curiosity I now aim to foster in students. The course content includes a range of media, authorship, and audience. Each week there is content to read, to watch, and to browse. So different verbs, different modes of engagement, something for every learner. Readings include scholarship from multiple fields, as well as industry articles and amateur writings. Videos include a TED talk on fiction cover design and a rare bookseller comparing periodicals to books, as well as student presentations. Then websites to browse. Students surf through mid-century lesbian pulp fiction books and 70s punk rock scenes. They, the browsing activities are sort of a lazy way to be productive. Even if students click through absentmindedly, they heighten their awareness of how the digital mediates the material and they learn to navigate archives. Research is the basis of, basis of most assignments. So I'll go through those now and then um, share some key principles. Engagement is most substantially class discussions in Canvas. It's an online space for seminar-like conversations. The first assignment is a 500 word reflection. Since library access had been restricted during the thick of the pandemic, I asked students to shop their own bookshelves. I've since realized that this brings up questions of privilege, but I've always been able to work out alternatives with students who don't have publications in their domestic space. Students choose a publication and make observations on its weight, thickness, size, paper, topography, colors, etc. It's a journal-like activity about what they see and feel sort of a warm up to get comfortable with observing, reflecting on and discussing design. And I get a lot of papers on uh, children's books and cookbooks for this assignment. Then a presentation. In an asynchronous class, students pre-record their slides and voice. Roughly two students present each week on topics that complement that week's theme. 
I message each student with prompts and sources for topics, and I'm always opening virtual doors for students. So to me, to classmates, to the content. The assignment asks a series of five questions that we see here. What circumstances gave rise to your topic? Who were the primary and secondary audiences? What problems did it solve? Was it inventive, innovative, or derivative? And what were its long lasting impacts? These questions are in all the research assignments. For the presentation, I ask a sixth question about the personal connection to the topic. And a lot of scholarship removes the author, but I encourage students to share their viewpoint. A standout presentation was on mass market paperbacks. A student made a brilliant video of his dad's collection of John Grisham's. It was so successful that I now explicitly encourage students to tap into their intergenerational knowledge. It enhances their connection to course content and develops their personal relationships with elders. The main research assignment has two parts, proposal, then submission. Students choose a slice of publication design history that interests them. They share their research in an essay or project format of their choice. I was inspired to offer a project option because of my own undergrad experience. I was in a French Enlightenment course with filmmakers and sculptors and painters and dancers. We were expected to create a work of art to demonstrate our research. I was intimidated because I don't sculpt or paint. Long story short, I curated a shoebox full of Enlightenment-ish objects. The only one I would remember was a spoon, but never mind. I attached an index card to each object, explaining its significance and relationship to the other objects. I had zero art skills, I felt, so I didn't think the project looked great, but it didn't too much matter. My research was evident, my effort was obvious, and my ideas managed to shine through the clunky shoebox. A thousand years ago, I wrote countless undergrad essays that I have since forgotten, still more that I remember, but I only did one project like that. It challenged me to think about how I could share my research and ideas in a format other than long form text. So developing a non-linear material product meant that I learned different information, came up with different ideas and different ways of articulating them. So that's what I offer students a chance to do. Put pieces of history in conversation with each other. Uh, one of my favorite curatorial projects from a student was a video in which they pretended to run a comic book shop and give an historically informed sales pitch to an imaginary customer. The most popular topic by a landslide is Vogue cover design. Uh, on the screen here, we have some of my current students' projects. A video virtually installing Lord of the Rings covers in an art gallery, website prototypes on Christmas catalogs and manga, an art history zine focused on Lord of the Flies covers, and an inspiration board for a project that mocked up magazine spreads on the history of National Geographic. However students deliver their researches, research and analyses, they again need to address the questions about historical circumstances that I set forth with the presentation assignment. They get comfortable with those questions as a consistent research framework. Next is a take home exam. Students have a week to analyze one image, like a photo of a magazine spread or a photo of a book cover. I give basic identification information so they can research the publication. They again answer the five questions from the previous assignments. Their comfort with that framework minimizes an exam anxiety and helps them focus on research and analysis. This time they express their findings concisely, so it's a paragraph per question. Last is a 500 word reflection. Students consider what is gained and lost by interacting with print on screen versus in hand. It leads to critical thinking about digital archives and access, durability, collectability, and uses of print at the time of publication versus now. Each reflection is an easy 5% to bookend the course, so students feel good at the start and the end of the course. Throughout it, my guiding principle is empathy. The effects of the pandemic are still lingering and I want to ease unnecessary burdens. 
So this course is asynchronous, flexible, accessible, not diverse, which I'll explain in a second, and personal. There aren't class-wide meetings when I offer this course online. When delivering content asynchronously, students don't have to make stressful choices between attending class or coping with precarious pandemic circumstances like these. Many of these are no longer widespread issues, but I've got them here as a kind of meta way of historically situating when and why I developed this history course in the ways that I did. Since campus reopened, I've variously taught this course in person and online still. I've also developed a similar postgrad course that actually takes materiality as the foundation for studying histories of editing and marketing and so on. Actually, one postgrad gave a performance in class. They personified editions of Shakespeare's plays. So we had a no fear edition, um, a penguin edition, and a scholarly edition. And they ran um, origin story dialogue that they thought these editions would say to each other if you know books came to life. The performance was excellent. Um, but back to undergrads online. To further mitigate the impact of these life stresses, I hand out extensions, honestly, like they're candy. I encourage students to check in with me if they can't meet a deadline so that I can offer sympathies or supports and manage my own workload. Um, that communication is valuable in building trust and getting the best out of students. I also help brainstorm really unconventional ideas. That's how I get students to embody old, dusty Norton critical editions. And frankly, it's where I find the most fun in teaching. All content to read, watch, and browse is free. Again, easing burdens and opening doors for different types of learners. Neurodivergent students in particular really appreciate the variety of things. During my first offering of this course, um, George Floyd's murder prompted a surge of Black Lives Matter protests, and that prompted me to call out my own syllabus as predominantly white and male. This imbalance is an ongoing challenge for me, and it's one that I openly acknowledge to students. Much of the content reflects an Anglo-American publishing industry and design canon that have marginalized many groups of people. I welcome students to help make design history inclusive and diverse. Even if they choose a main, mainstream topic like mid 20th century romance novels, they ought to consider who did and did not design or buy those novels and why. Maybe high end production values put the price of books out of the reach of audiences with little disposable income. Maybe cover art depicting a white hetero couple excluded BIPOC and or queer audiences. Design, consumer, and research choices are now and have always been political. I frame pedagogical and scholarly challenges as opportunities for students to help make change. Using current events as a springboard for discussing history helps make it relevant. Instead of dull and dusty, it's ripe for recovery and new narratives. Again, I've subtitled the course A History, Not The History. Students connect with the content by tapping into their personal histories and, as I said, intergenerational knowledge. For example, I set out to teach about wartime paper sort shortages and unexpectedly led one student to learn about their family's immigration. This deep engagement happens roughly midway through the semester when students are fully comfortable and publications are recent enough to trigger memories. Students draw on their memories to fill gaps aspects of publications that are not visible on screen. This is an imperfect list of print qualities that are and aren't perceptible on screen. Digital images flatten and tear apart print publications object hoods. Often, but not always, double page spreads become single pages, covers come detached, and end papers are not at the ends. The online isolation of print design and production values the lack of cohesion and the disruption of linearity are inconsistent with the objecthood of the codex. We talk through these limitations. In a virtual classroom, we look at books rather than look through them and smell, feel, and hear them. 
But the flip side is that students engage with more publications and a greater range than they can access in person. They also critique platforms that facilitate on-screen engagement, which is, for better or worse, an important part of the publication design history landscape. As I said, I'm an accidental historian. Reflecting on how I frame and teach history, I have more to say than I thought I had. So thank you for sharing uh, this opportunity with me to look at printed pasts and digital features. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was um, a really great paper. And I'm sorry that you couldn't actually see us because I think if you had, you'd have seen us nodding along and like really like inspired and in awe of your students' work, which just looked um, incredible. And I, I thought it was really lovely, actually. Like it reminds me of a paper that we had earlier on in the series that talks about this idea of actually increasing object literacy and how this really centers the idea of like reading the object rather than reading the text. And I thought that was just brilliant. So I don't know if anyone has any questions um, for Amanda. Um, like I said, you can put them in the chat function or alternatively you can unmute yourself and um, ask your questions. So I'll just give you um, a minute. Amanda, one of the things I really was um, kind of struck with was this idea of read, watch and um, browse. And I just wondered like whether or not you could say anything about how the students in enjoy that because of that idea of like dismantling the idea of long prose reading as a way of engaging with the past. Yeah, I didn't want to assign, um, I'll start with what I didn't want to do, which was assign, you know, 20 page articles for students who come from outside of the publishing discipline. Um, and we don't have a major in publishing. We have, it's either a minor or an extended minor. So everyone is from somewhere else in my courses. Um, and I felt that, you know, the heady prose of scholarship would be alienating to, um, to some students who come from like criminology and sociology and um, filmmaking and things like that all over the university. So, um, and also Zoom fatigue uh, during the height of the pandemic and students just not necessarily wanting to um, to stare at a screen uh, and, and read pages upon pages of prose. So I thought, how do we break this up? How do we get some more visual aspects into the course? And um, one of the really great ways for seeing books online is actually through seeing videos because then we get to see someone else interact with the object. We might not be able to, but at least we can see how um, double page spreads come together as units, for example. We can see content facing each other in a spread. Um, we can see someone holding up uh, a Dickens fascicle compared to a Dickens book. And that was really important for students to understand proportion, scale, um, all of those other qualities that we can't see on screen when we just see a photo of a cover. Um, and usually photos online are covers, not interior pages. So videos were a great supplement to that. And then for browsing activities, um, they can just sort of, it can be a Friday night and they know they have to do homework, but they don't feel like reading. So they can just keep clicking. And it's sort of a passive way of increasing their, um, their visual literacy and getting to grips with different types of page layouts, different kinds of topography, um, so on and so forth. So that's been a really great way to, um, to depart from having, you know, 100% of the course content be, be articles and so forth. I think that's just brilliant. It's just a lovely inclusive way as well, like for like, like United and the neurodivergent um, reader as well. Um, yeah. There's a question from Andrea who wonders if you could just say a bit more about what alternatives you provided for students who didn't have books in their environment. So it became lots of questions about do they have to be my books? Do I have to have a personal connection to them? No. If it's the pandemic and you're stuck at your parents' house, look at your parents' cookbooks, look at your parents' John Grisham's, whatever, whatever is on hand. Um, 
if there are no books in your space, because some students, uh, you know, students move about a lot, they don't always bring their books with them. Um, so sometimes they were in spaces where they didn't have any publications. In that case, I asked them to think about their most memorable book that they had encountered. And that's where a lot of children's books came up. Um, and I asked them to consider um, how they thought their memories might have changed their perception of the book, what they might have remembered accurately versus you know, how things might be tinged, right? Because if you're reading a children's book when you're small, um, the book seems really big. <laughs> As an adult with, you know, bigger hands, it, it doesn't quite seem so large. So those were other sorts of questions that we were able to engage with. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So, Jocelyn, I don't know if you want to set up your presentation. Um, I'm just, I'm just, sorry, I just love the idea of Read, Watch, Browse. Can I use that, please? Sure. I think that, I think that is fascinating. I really <laughs> do. Thank you so much. Um, I think, do we need Amanda to un unshare? I mean, oh, am I still sharing? It says that I'm not. No? No, hold on. Oh, there you go. Oh, all right. Sorry, I didn't realize you were staring at a slide the whole time. <laughs> no, 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 it was good. I, I, I loved the distinction between perceptible and imperceptible as well. I love that. Um, okay, let's see if I have no problems this time. I want to make sure because I added a couple of things. Nope, I added a couple of slides to things when I was talking. Um, can you see that? Can you see that? Yes, we can see that. Yeah. And when I click further, can you see that? Yeah, we can see right. that. Okay. Now, similarly to Amanda, because I've been having problems with version control today, I had no idea why. Um, I've now in a situation where I can't see you guys. So if there's any problems or anything like that, then um, please let me know. Um, really, really thank you so much, Lucy, and also Kath, if, she, if and when she looks at the slides, my fellow um, Darby um, colleague. Um, thank you so much. Um, the presentation I'm doing today, obviously, is reimagining book history creatively for 21st century publishing students. Now, this all came about um, 21st century publishing students, I have found, often struggle to recognise the relevance of book history to their pursuit of um, careers in publishing and how this applies to the contemporary publishing industry. Responding to now, responding to a survey in 2019 and 2020 for my monograph, Teaching, Publishing and Editorial Practice, the transition from university to industry published by CUP earlier in the year, a graduate student stated the following, quote, the theory or history behind publishing is interesting, but doesn't really matter when it comes to working in industry. The only history that's relevant is understanding the market and how it changes. Um, teaching book history to contemporary students thus requires a more creative conceptualization um, to foster, um, I believe, better understanding of how book history is just as living as the present and how this living history and its publishing legacies embodies not only change but also continuity with and connection to the 21st century um, um, publishing practitioners. Now, the course that I teach is um, Books and Society, and it is a 10-week um, master's course. Um, we've just actually, I had my last class today. And according to the, the module specifications, I need a, um, to a, address or introduce students to the history and culture of publishing over 500 years. And that's a lot of stuff to get through. Um, in 10 weeks, um, and particularly for students who have never studied um, publishing before um, as an, um, at an undergraduate level, um, and a lot of them actually aren't, um, haven't um, studied history either. So um, 
And the module learning outcomes for this are critically evaluate primary and or secondary historical information and sources and place them in historical and cultural context of the publishing, printing, printing and literary industries, acquire a broad understanding of the major trends, events and debates of UK publishing since the 15th century and world publishing since 1900, and then to plan research and write an academic essay covering a clear and coherent argument and a mature understanding of secondary sources. Again, a challenge, because um, this is the first time I've taught book history, not only at Derby, but um, is my first academic permanent appointment. So this was a challenge as an early career researcher as well. But you can see in terms of the structure, thinking about historical ev evidence, certainly looking at Gutenberg and the beginnings of the commercial book trade through the early modern period, the long 18th century, serialization and into the 19th and 20th centuries. Now the two um, assessments um, that I've got that the student, and they're actually built into the, the modules to specification. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, um, limitations or constraints, unfortunately, at the moment. So coursework one being an individual essay of 1,000 words, um, of it, um, and then um, it's historical source review and analysis, and then the, the individual essay. Um, when I began, um, even way before I was thinking I needed to teach this, because teaching for first semester in the UK is in September, um, I put out a call on Twitter in, in March and I said, book historians, how do you conceptualise and practice a student-led cl classroom teaching book history, both under and post-grad, all feedback and thoughts welcome. Um, didn't realise that I, as an editor, I'd, I'd misspelled practice, so apologies there. Um, now, I, I got a lot of different feedback from people, but when I was first, before I put out that call, I conceived, I wanted to place book history and its connection to, and its publishing legacies and its connection to 21st century publishing, thinking about the production schedule from authorship through production reception to creation. And the types of reconceptualizing that I thought I would focus on in, in, for the hands-on activities in class to put theory into practice was what I classed destructive bibliography, thinking about the printing press for production, thinking about bookshops and libraries for reception, but also curation in terms of local and digital archives. But I I, through the um, discussion on Twitter, I, it helped me to reconceive certain bits and about how I would approach it, particularly from a low budget um, perspective, because at Derby, we don't have a special collections um, library at our library and we so we have very limited resources so Stephen van imp said for a disconstructionist dis approach give each student a cheap paperback proceed like a, and a knife proceed like a biology biology teacher would with a dead rabbit it's difficult to ignore the materiality of something you're trying to destroy so again these feelings of this destructive um, deconstructionist approach when it comes to looking at the book as amanda was talking about most people, almost most students, think of a book in terms of its content rather than its materiality um, being an element um, working hand in hand with that. Um, and Samantha Narayana at um, UCL said, um, yes, in non-COVID times, um, um, we do a session with UCL Publishing and the brilliant Hop 1970 who brings in books and scalpels for students to dissect the gasp when she makes the first cut never gets old. Now, again, my feeling was I'm new to Derby. I just, um, in March, I just moved from Australia to the UK with a suitcase um, and I had no resources whatsoever. So my feeling then at the bottom, because um, Stephen went on to say, because um, um, I was concerned about the cost, um, he, um, he was saying, well, look, ask for your local librarian or redundant encyclopedias or copies of Fifty Shades of Grey, et cetera. You don't necessarily need to deconstruct a, a, a material artifact from the 17th century. Well, you wouldn't do that anyway. Um, so I thought, well, that's a really good idea about, um, because I'm new to Derby, building local um, um, 
connections with libraries and um, use bookstores and things like that to start building um, resources. So um, as I said in the tweet, this is a really great idea. I'm going to try to become hopeful best buddies with my university librarians. That is a work in process even now in, in November. Um, Dylan Lewis from um, was saying, emphasizing that copies are just as important as editions, learning how to critically read paratexts in terms of attention to material and graphic elements. Now, certainly he works um, or studies um, and has access to a media lab. So he's to invest in a cheap um, so, um, 19th to 20th century pan press from eBay. Well, I don't have those funds. I mean, I do absolutely want to invest in that when, when we have the resources at Derby, but we just don't have that now. So I'm thinking, okay, well, what am I going to do when thinking about... Um, um, Kate Osman also gave some fantastic advice. I try to let students encounter objects and see what they see, then give them scaffolding from scholarship to help them in, in, interpret it. This is a flip from where I started. And um, JP Asher also said it was useful to think of showing someone a gap as separate than showing them how to bridge that gap. Um, certainly the, he's, he's implying there the student-led learning as opposed to um, the, the teachers talking at students rather than with and empowering them to, to learn. Um, so, and then, I've, then, I, but then I was thinking, well, I don't have all these resources. I'm thinking again about this budget that I, this low teaching book history on a budget. Um, because Claire Bourne was quite rightly said to say one thing out loud, we need a course that stresses how to teach book history when you don't have institutional access to deep school, um, special collections, which um, Lisa Maruka um, absolutely agreed with as well. So what, how can we at smaller institutions took, teach book history, which is very um, um, mindful of its materiality, when you don't have resources. So um, what I did was, I'm thinking, well, in terms of production, I tried to think about activities, hands-on activities where students um, um, transform theory into practice. So I had them, you know, I did the destructive bibliography. I had them working as scribes. Um, for in terms of 19th century periodicals, I got them to actually scissor, cut um, um, scissors and paste, do scissors and paste journalism. In terms of bookshops and libraries, we actually went to an excursion into the, li the local library as well as our local bookshop, and we dug into the local and digital archives like the Hearty Trust um, online, um, the archive online, as well as Google Books and um, and, um, and Gail. So in terms of the, the pedagogy that's underpinning everything, Ashton, and thank you, Lucy, for actually bringing me this book to my attention. Um, A to Z of creative teaching and higher education, Ashton Stone say three very, very insightful observations at the beginning of their book. First, quote, we suggest that all creative teaching practices are assessed for authenticity, integrity and effectiveness. And I really think that's amazing. And it really underpins everything that I do. Because of course, yes, I'm teaching book history, but I'm trying to make it relevant and applicable and to show publishing legacies in the 21st century. She also goes, um, goes on a quote, we teach in the belief that learning happens through social interaction citing the Kovsky and Cole 17, 1978, and that knowledge is constructed through the form of communities of practice who share a concern or passion about a topic. And that, that the italics for emphasis is, is theirs. Um, so in, in terms of the, the activities that I do in class, it is thinking about authenticity, integrity, effectiveness, moving from theory to practice, but also doing these in communities of practice and trust and passion. And lastly, they say another theme is that of the curriculum is praxis. That is reflection and action upon the world in order to transform it. So in transforming this theory through the creative practice um, and then reflecting on that, on that praxis. And I get that through, I get them to upload their reflections almost weekly to the, our online Blackboard discussion board. So in terms of the activities I've done, I've done the, the destructive bibliography where we actually look at a book as it is more than really as a sum of its parts, thinking about this book's anatomy 
and really digging deeper into the, the aspects like binding um, the choirs or the gatherings of these things, how they work with the signatures at the bottom of the page and the directions on the bottom of the page um, and, the, the, um, and the covers uh, um, preliminary and end matter. Um, so these are some examples of, of photos that I have. I, very, very low cost. I bought some, I went to Wilco and I bought these scalpel things. So hopefully they didn't contravene H O H and S too much. I brought in my, my placemats from home so I didn't damage the tables. And I bought for 50p at um, some book um, um, garage sales some um, 19th century, 20th century, 20th century books that they could deconstruct um, to actually look at the binding, look at the choirs and um, see how these books work. Um, another one was an acti uh, activity that I did was simulating manuscript culture and, pro and the process of transitioning from manuscript to print. So I got to them to write a hypothetical letter and um, of a minimum of two paragraphs then they had to they had to write it with a pen and paper. They couldn't use any whiteout or liquid paper. They had then had to swap that letter with um, a peer of theirs, and again they had to trans they had to um, transcribe that letter again, taking very a lot of care with form and presentation, not using any liquid paper. And of course, I don't have access to a printing press, so we used Word to simulate the movement from manuscript to print. Um, and again, they had to um, reproduce that text, and but they had to actually not um, change anything about it. And then they needed to write up their reflections on the discussion board on Blackboard. And I've got an exam. So there's some examples of where their students are just uh, writing um, their own letters, where they're transcribing the letters from one of their peers and then using their devices like a, one, one person was using a mobile phone, one person was using an iPad and two others were using um, their, um, their laptops. Um, this is an example of a student reflection um, Mitch said, one of the fa factors regarding reproducing a text by hand that I didn't initially realise was how a style difference from one set of handwriting to another can alter the line spacing words per line quite drastically. Even when trying my best to match the specific size of the original writing, stylistic differences like letter spacing and word spacing still meant that my writing was one or two lines different in size than the original piece. And he goes on to talk more about theory there. Um, now, in week seven, we, we were thinking about globalisation and creating colonial editions. Um, and from Australia, I, um, I obtained the, um, a copy of the um, Launceston, the first issue of the Launceston Advertiser that was published by John Faulkner, um, Pascal Faulkner, one of the um, earliest printers in Australia, and it was printed on the 9th of February, 1829. And we simulated scissors and paste um, um, journalism, um, creating colonial editions. So I got the, um, um, Darby, uh, uh, the um, digital copy of the Derby Mercury, I got the Leicester Chronicle, I got the Sheffield Independent, I got the Standard. Um, certainly, they wouldn't, um, in Australia in, on the 9th of February 1829, they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have had access to um, newspapers that were five days old. But certainly you get the idea in terms of they would have been obtaining this content from overseas and they would have been mashing up, basically, picking and choosing, curating content um, to place into the periodicals along with lo um, the local content. And this is some examples of the, the scissors and paste um, that they were doing. I spent about 10 or 12 pounds. I had to buy scissors. I had to buy glue um, um, from our local Blackwell's bookshop downstairs at, at Dar University of Derby. And so I printed out um, each copy of, um, so it was the Standard, the, the Derby Mercury, the Sheffield Independent. So I printed out A3 copies and gave them blank A3 sets. So they had to actually produce the a first, their own iteration of the Lancaster, Lancaster advertiser on an A3 page. Um, so they had to read through all of the four um, uh, um, um, issues of the, the newspapers, 
decide which of the content would be interesting to the local Launcestons at that time in the 19th century, um, and then create their own version, which there are some examples here, um, there. Um, and then an example was a student reflection. I really enjoyed this task. Combining news information from all five periodicals allowed for the centre of Tasmania to um, actually, she misunderstood the centre as England to gain insight into the periphery, which is Tasmania. I thought it best that the paper, pieces I took from the law assistant advertiser go at the top, allowing for the readership to start the centre of their own country and knowledge and work outwards towards the periphery. That's actually a very interesting way of interpreting it. Um, then I took them, to, the idea of um, bookshops as literary nexus, because at Derby, at Derby the Waterstons, is right on the corner. I don't know if anyone here knows, um, knows Derby where the Waterstons is, right on that corner. Um, and I went to a book sell, the booksellers um, online workshop a few um, months ago um, that was facilitated by um, um, Eden News and Samantha Rayner. And there was one of the presenters works at the Sam Reed booksellers. And again, this um, old bookshop um, established in 1887 is on the corner at the nexus. So I really quite wanted to um, um, inspire the students to look at bookshops in a, in a different three-dimensional way. Um, and so I got, we went into the Waterstones bookshop last week and I got them to stand outside the bookshop for five minutes and look at the, the, the traffic on both vehicular and pedestrian going past and in and out. I got them to have a think about the internal architecture of the Watersons and how the books are categorised. I, I asked them to look at the shelf displays, I asked them to look at the table displays, and I asked them to look at any sort of readerly paratextual information. And here are some really <laughs> lovely um, pictures that I took. I think um, the one at the top with the students standing outside on the street, I think they look a bit like lost puppies there. But you can see that um, meter on the right is upstairs on the first level looking at the, the categorization, the architecture. Um, on the bottom left, you can see my student um, Liv looking at the, show, um, the, the table displays. And of course, Mitch in the center is looking, is holding up Eric Carl's caterpillar, thinking about the paratextuality of bookshops. Um, so, um, and this is just one of my students, Liv, she said, best books and society class today studying the bookshop as a literary nexus. Went to Waterson's Derby and looked at the bookshop in ways I've never thought about before. So I'm thinking about these transformative moments moving from um, theory to practice, but transforming students' ideas about bookshops, um, not only in terms of bookshops from the past and how they operated, but how that had the continuity and change of bookshops in the 21st century to see these publishing legacies. Um, and of course, she um, also provided, I got the students to, on the um, discussion board to then provide a reflective report about their experiences. Um, and there's an example with, um, them and she says the book, amount of bookish paraphernalia was actually fascinating and how important the role it has in the act of reading and book buying and she goes on to talk about that. Um, so, and the, so um, I was really, really concerned because this is the first time I've done this module at Derby or I've done um, at, um, anywhere. Um, and the, the feedback that I got was very encouraging. Um, the one on the left, this was anonymous feedback saying, considering that this is Jocelyn's first teaching module at Derby, the module runs as smoothly and effectively as it is of being long established. The content is fascinating, gripping and presented by the all named Jocelyn in fantastic uh, engaging ways. Now, certainly the, the one on the right says the same thing, but um, that's why I'm quite fascinated with what um, Amanda was talking about, um, read, watch and browse. Because one of the things I struggled with, because I'm I am having to cover 500 years of publishing history in basically nine to 10 weeks. So one of the students bits of feedback was the readings are my biggest hurdle. They're very dense and can be long. So that it would be my only issue. Um, so that is something definitely um, that I will have to um, work on for the next iteration of the course um, going forward for the next academic year. Um, now, um, I just, how am I running with the time, Lucy? 
you do need to start wrapping up. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually finishing up now. So what I thought, what I did to conclude now, um, through this, in terms of this reconceptualing, this transformation, hopefully this putting into practice and these group um, tasks, um, creating communities of learning and passion, um, encouraging students to foster, as I said before, better understanding of how book history is just as living as the present. Um, but I am, I am mindful of the fact that this um, reconceptualization, I want to try and move more towards student learning in terms of face-to-face -face hybrid and cloud-based contexts. But I am at the moment, um, I find that I'm challenged by my own um, um, history of, of, of being a student and my own history of being a teacher more um, and so that's the challenges I find leading um, into the next iteration of this course um, is to try to um, reconceptualize these assessments but of course that needs um, administrative requests in terms of changing the model specification but those those things are for, for the future so I hope you enjoyed I hope it wasn't too too um, brisk but that, that's my um, my thing for today. Thank you very much. Um, it raised some really interesting points. I think even this idea of like actually how being creative can actually cost a lot of money and we don't have those budgets in place in terms of how we're teaching. Like we yeah. can claim for research expenses, but we can't claim for teaching expenses or um, I'm like you, I've had to run in and like try and get cheap scissors and glue and, um, and um, bits and pieces for my own um, teaching, which is like always a real concern. So I don't know if anyone's got any questions um, for Jocelyn. Um, otherwise, um, you can put them into the chat or you can unmute yourself. But alternatively, um, we can move on to Madoka, who's going to be Aww. talking about um, Japanese um, Japanese um, manga magazines. I'm really excited about this paper. Um, so hopefully like, you can upload okay um i just have a question if i can yeah go for it yeah um jocelyn and we connected about this on twitter when i saw your student tweet about um the bookshop excursion yeah that was sort of a moment for me where i was like this would be amazing in my course for so many reasons but i'm curious about the logistics of it um, like, did you tell staff that you were coming in? Did everyone look conspicuous and awkward when they were wandering around? How many students uh, did you have? Yeah. Well, I'm, that's a very good question. I, I have only got um, five students this, this semester. So um, in terms of, because I asked my, my program leader, um, well, do I need to fill out any paperwork? And he said, yeah. well, no, <laughs> quietly. Um, and um, so because I, we just jumped on the, the uni shuttle and mm -hmm. uh, w while they were outside looking at the traffic in and past, in and out of the bookshop, I actually went to the manager. Now, I, um, they were very nice because I didn't actually go, I hit them with that with five minutes notice. But if I had a larger class, like 20, um, then I would have probably liaised with the bookshop in advance because, of course, 20 students going in and, and browsing the shelves and going up and down the stairs and, um, and if they'd had any questions that, to ask the staff, that would have been quite unmanageable. So I, if I'd had, I would have contacted them earlier. But as it was, while they were outside doing this sort of more ethnographic work, um, I went in and say, hey, do you mind if we come in? If they, if you're not busy, then perhaps they might field any questions. So, and it was, it was, it, when we went in, it was around, oh, 11.30 in the morning. So mm -hmm. it wasn't terribly busy. So I think that factored into um, it not being problematic either. Um, but yeah, um, because there were three floors, um, they were able to go in and out of the, the, the floors and not be disruptive. But certainly, I think if you, how many people do you have in your class? Uh, right now I have 18. Yeah, yeah, you probably, that might be a little bit more problematic. Okay. Uh, mind you, depending on the, the bookshop you go to, I mean, Waterstones and Nottingham is like five floors. Yeah, <laughs> and spread so, out yeah, yeah. So um, thankfully, I didn't need to do any administrative paperwork. Um, and I went in just on the day. But as I said, if if there were more students, 
rather than five, I would have actually pre-planned it. Yeah. My, my brain is sort of spinning now. We'll have to connect outside of this because I'm thinking if the timing matched up for each of us to do that activity with your students there, my students here, and then compare results. That would be awesome. I love that idea. Love so that's it. a side talk. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, Amanda. Awesome, awesome. Yep. <laughs> so as one of my students just said, oh yeah, I've got one of my students obviously in the in the in the um, hello meter. Okay, um, awesome. Thank you. Uh, great to see that this is um, having this facilitation. But um, Madoka, um, I'll turn over to you. Um, this is working, but we can't hear you if you're speaking. I think you're muted. I, I I'm can't sorry. Oh, yeah, I was. I'm so yeah. sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> no problem. I, 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 Teams is the, one of the most challenging things I've ever worked with. <laughs> okay, let me share the screen. Um, can you see? It's just it's just uploading that. Yeah, it's uploaded. Um, okay, so I'll just try to move the slide. Yep, that's worked. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, okay, hi. Um, so my name is Madoka Nagado, and in this presentation, I'd like to share my attempts at integrating Japanese manga comics as a tool to teach history to Japanese college students. So um, just a, a, a little bit of my background. When I had a chance to teach the history of British literature, the first thing I realized was the students were very unfamiliar with or uninterested in not only British literature, but also the history it came from. Only a few famous authors such as Shakespeare were known to them and the students presented great difficulties in making sense of how the history of Europe and the UK have intertwined. And precisely because they couldn't grasp the and were very reluctant to learn. So the initial motivation for using comic books in class was to draw their attention. The popularity of manga in Japan, as you know, have been long standing and are keeping going strong today. So this is the scene I cut out from some manga to explain Brexit. The students reacted quickly to this visual and exaggerated personification of countries, showing some engagement and understanding. I was very encouraged by this. Uh, so I added one question to the end term student feedback survey to ask about the use of manga. So these are uh, some of the students answer and my question. This student feedback is illustrative of how manga can enhance their motivation. And also to me, it was very suggestive of being more creative regarding how it can be used. But um, my plan and the way I use manga is not as physically, create, physically creative as using a scissors or a paintbrush. It's still reading and writing. Um, but I still expect it can still challenge students to practice their critical reading and research skills. As a lecturer of British literature, I tend to see history as a series of past events as well as individuals' actions. Therefore, by adapting a histori historiography approach, my purpose is by creatively engaging with objects in manga, let students learn how to actively read and interpret history. There has been a study on comics educational potential. 
including graphic novels such as Mouse and Fun Home, visual text can help students develop multimodal literacies, prompting them to engage in critical thinking and analysis. According to Will Eisner's classic description, comics are a sequential art that produces, quote, a sequence of events or pictures so as to bridge the gaps in action, end quote. Like any other terminologies, manga has been defined differently. So for now, I'll use manga to refer to comics created in Japan and published first in Japanese language. The distinctions between traditional Western comics and Japanese manga used to be much bigger, but in this age of online media and the global book publishing, the styles of each culture have influenced and blended into each other. However, some of the unique characteristics of manga still remain recognizable. The primary one of them, which is what my project focuses on, is its meticulous depiction of the small parts. As shown in the illustration left, a comic book studies scholar, Scott McLeod, points out that in small real world details, we can find, quote, an appreciation for the beauty of the mundane and its value for connecting with the reader's everyday experiences, end quote. Also, as shown in the right picture, he also explores how panels are constructed in manga, quote, by splitting an opening scene into fragments using aspect-to-aspect -aspect transitions, manga characteristically uses multiple panels to establish a setting in which the scene assembled in the reader's mind." End quote. To put it simply, manga panels provide both the larger environment and the small detail of the object. Besides some exceptions like study manga, which is specifically made to provide educational materials, manga's primary intent is to entertain. And due to its entertainment purpose, some background accounts and context need to be embedded and adapted to a fictional frame, which resonates what historian Emmanuel Mikkel and other scholars point out, quote, from the earliest examples, the writing of history has been intertwined with fiction. And thus, history and historiography are established core areas of research within all academic fields that deal with adaptation." End quote. This is the driving rationale behind how I use manga in a history class and what students will get from the manga-based assignments. So in designing a history of British literature course, I used this manga, Seven Shakespeare's by Japanese cartoonist, Harorudo Saku Ishii. This manga is in the same way as the 1998 American British film, Shakespeare in Love, the plot involves an untold story of Shakespeare's life and his creative process, incorporating the theory of there being multiple collaborators engaging in making Shakespeare a playwright. Closely tied to the main plot, an equally vital element in the story is the historical and political context of Elizabethan England, with a supposition that both Shakespeare and the Queen herself were Catholic. Therefore, in order to fully enjoy the story, students need to understand the complex background of that spirited age because the theme of religion accompanies most of the decisive moments in the story. For instance, Shakespeare and other main characters always need to act based on the norms and rules of that day to find out who is on their side before taking action or doing anything at all in public. 
So um, these panels depicts the scene in which Shakespeare is meeting Ferdinand Stanley for the first time to seek his protection and support as a patron of the theater. While waiting for him, Shakespeare notices a piece of artwork hanging on the wall in the reception room. Initially, they cannot identify the subject of the portrait. But once they do, they start to doubt which side Stanley is on, if he is an enemy and their safety. So now students need to predict whose portrait could make them behave in such a way by using clues in the assigned reading and placing it in a historical context. I would give them hints or show them how to do a reverse image search when needed. My goal here is to let students overcome a tendency to passive reading. And in a manga format, visual material accompanying text invites them to do image analysis, which can enhance their interpretive and observational skills in the process. Some students would immediately recognize an iconic color the person in the painting wears, which has been previously introduced to them through the history textbook with a liberal use of illustrations or through the cover of Norton Anthology. So this is another um, assignment. By paying attention to manga's small details, students can do a simple fact check activity. Central to this argument here concerns the use of appropriation when manga artists adapt the selections of historical accounts into a story. And this thing is also for fact check activity. So like this, scones and bowling, understanding the relationship between fact and fiction, students examine the veracity of each historical scene depicted in manga through research via literature review, library sources, online archives, and so on. To examine if things that are familiar to them if they are existed in the 17th century, and if they did, they needed to consider in what way histories are a creation of many different peoples and their interests. And lastly, involving in a more substantial research, students will combine their observational skills and research skills Creating object biography has been a popular activity in multiple fields, including archaeology, material culture studies, art history, and so forth. According to Anne Sophie Riemann, quote, the biography offers entry points even if no information is available and encourages interdisciplin interdisciplinarity as object straddle many fields. The object biography stimulates new forms of writing because it lends the object a voice and foregrounds narrative." End quote. Usually, main life cycle from production to consumption. But in my manga-based assignment, the interest is in the moment it existed. Students will investigate and describe a selected object in depth to connect dots to correspond to the surrounding narrative. So first, students are given some scenes in which a small object plays an important role that leads to consequences for the character's decisions, adding stakes to the story. For example, in this scene, 
a boy actor finds himself at Shakespeare's house as he has no place to stay. Picking up the boy's shabby coat to give it a wash, a resident of the house notices something fall out of the pocket. When the boy wakes up, he is quite upset because he, he can find that object nowhere. In the last panel, when he sees the object held in a man's hand, he looks shocked or even terrified. So to understand what is going on here, students need to identify the object. So this is an um, answer key. That object he lost was a pilgrim badge engraved with St. Thomas Beckett. As it turns out, the object is a saint's icon. The photos shown here are a kind of evidence I hope students will find through their research and use to write about the object. And let me give you just one more example. This scene depicts the earlier event of that manga story when Shakespeare and his friend were ad adolescent boys, an episode that's part of his lost years. To start life anew, great. Then Shakespeare runs into a man, seemingly a clergy of the Church of England, doing something besides a large hole on the ground filled with shards of something broken. Shakespeare snatches a piece quickly and examines it, and he and his friend immediately recognize what it is. And also they come to see that the man was not burying them, but digging them up. So again, to understand the situation, students research to identify the object and why the man looks suspicious. So this is the answer with the history of iconoclasm described in manga. And these on the left are some images of the restored stained glass. Compared to the fact-checking activity, the level of engagement with materials through writing is much higher and more difficult, I should, I should admit. Students will be given opportunities to independently read, examine, analyze, and reconstruct the reproduced history in manga through the image. In other words, by interacting with materials presented in manga, students can revisit the long gone unfamiliar past and the people involved in it in a more relatable manner than reading them in textbook and learn to exercise their historical imagination. Responding to a trend in museums and exhibitions in England, Michael Goncher in his 2014 New York Times piece emphasizes the importance of artifacts in visualizing the past and the historical interpretation evoked by them. As recent scholarship illustrates, historians have explored the challenges and the implications of the relationship between individual lives and the larger historical paradigms. Manga is one way in which a series of individual life stories unfolds in a broader environment. Since the panels characteristically developed in manga formats, quote, break up the single environment into smaller parts, which navigates reader to construct the whole environment in their minds, end quote. 
And the manga's visual format allows for historiographical discussions. I hope to use them as a means to increase students' interest in and knowledge of what the world in the past was really like beyond the information in a textbook. And ultimately, make them curious and a careful interpreter of the history. So yeah, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And these are not what I already did, but what I'd like to do for the next semester. So any suggestions or ideas are more than welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was um, really fascinating. I love this idea of like using um, a visual visual resource to encourage kind of like these um, creative um, research skills and the idea of like running off and looking um, for objects. I thought that was just like a really fascinating way of get like hooking students into into the <laughs> topic of British history and particularly uh, uh, particularly um, like the Shakespeare's time. Um, does anyone have any questions or um, um, questions for um, Madeka? Uh, if you notice any um, issues, if I did it, probably I'm, because as I said, this is just my plan. So I, I don't know if it works or not, especially, um, so doing the image search, um, probably they cannot find, like they have no idea what it is and cannot just do, the assignment at all. So um, if you did something similar in the past, like using some image and expanding it into the writing project, like a photo photography or something, um, yeah, I'd like to hear, like, I need your advice on this. Um, different, but this, as I said, this is the first time I've taught book history at Derby and really anywhere as part of my academic career. And about, so I, I so um, appreciate the anxiety because each time I did um, like, you know, the, the, the destructive bibliography, I was thinking, will it work? When I did the papers and scissors access exercise with trying to emulate um, colonial editions of um, um, British British content, but disruptively, in mm. terms of localized production, I thought, will it work? And all I can say is, it did. <laughs> it is just like it just, you know, you've got this inspiration, and you're so concerned. Oh my God! You wake up at two o'clock in the morning, you're thinking, Oh my God, will it work? calling up my husband who's in you know Australia and Melbourne will it work he says just use your gut and <laughs> so all I can say is if your gut says that this is how you want to disrupt and transform knowledge just go with it you know and you know it's I mean I there are so many ways just during the first and I, as I was teaching the course and as I said I've got 500 years to pack in to nine to 10 weeks with students who, you know, bless their cotton socks, have, have done undergraduate degrees, but never publishing studies or perhaps um, studied history. Oh, and, you know, UK history, because I've, um, um, and, but it just having the faith in the students mm -hmm. and um, allowing them the space to thrive as a community to feed off each other and work as peers. And I just stood back and let them go with it. And the results, as you can see with the photos, were just absolutely clear. So I just think that's my two cents worth is just that go with your gut because honestly, it was probably gonna be amazing. Thank you so much. I think that's all I needed to hear. <laughs> Thank you so much. So yeah, I shouldn't really expect like the Road is always smooth. Yeah, it's it can be really bumpy. And thank you so much. I was wondering, um, 
have you tested out to see whether or not those images can be picked up with um, the Google, the reverse Google image search? And if they then knock into some of the knock into some of the um, websites that you might be thinking of. Because um, I always think that's really I, I did that a couple of years ago with my students um, where I asked them to put in like a picture of a Victorian slum and then it brought other pictures up of Victorian slums. And it was really interesting to see that as a genre rather mm. than as a standalone, a standalone image. So even if they don't maybe knock into maybe the right information. Mm. Um, I suppose that if you're really worried, um, <laughs> I'm just like thinking off the top of my head, but like thinking of like history as a detective, like is it is it the case that like sometimes you might actually have to every so often drop in a like clue, like during the week to encourage them to um, sort of know that sometimes information is filtered rather than like immediately right in front of you. Thank you so much. That's yeah. I think that's very doable and yeah, like just not to this, like this crossing too much, <laughs> but just a little bit. Thank you. Hmm. But I, I love the idea of manga. When, when you started talking about it, I was like, oh my God, I, I should definitely be using comics <laughs> in, in like my, in my teaching. Like this would be such a great way of like getting them to familiarize themselves with like the city and like this. So like the idea of using it as a way of kind of like, visualizing history is just so, such an a creative kind of really I thought that was really good are you going to make them design a manga comic for you like or like do a manga like class activity of the reading or something so yeah I, I think because just listening to other people's ideas um yeah, I want to be more adventurous. Like you, you are your presentations are really inspired me, and just like yeah, I want to do like include some more play playing part. So <laughs> thank you so much. And <laughs> um, so I think we've had three really great papers. I know that I'm definitely like energized and mentally kind of thinking through some of the things I want to um, teach around kind of objects and visualizing. And so this has been really enjoyable. So thank you very much for coming, um, especially because like this has been a weird academic week for us in the United Kingdom with the strike. Um, and this is like um, sort of like uh, in between it, but also because I know that Amanda and uh, Madoka are like on totally different time zones. So uh, I think probably Madoka needs to go to bed and Amanda needs to probably like kickstart her day, but like sluggishly. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and I really enjoyed your papers. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks thank so you. much, Lucy. Bye. Hello? Hello, Madoka, can you hear yes, me? Yes, 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 yes. I, I was <laughs> just typing. Are you Josh? Yes, that's me. Yes, hello. That's that's incredible. I, I just can I just take a screenshot? Wow. Yeah. That's I just so... wanted to say I, I didn't mean to, I was just drawing. I forgot to uh, hang up the call, but I was just drawing and I saw you so you're still there. So I, was, I just I wanted to take the opportunity. That... Sorry, I just sorry, sorry, wanted to say uh, how much I enjoyed your talk, and obviously, I like drawing as a job. So, uh, really fascinating. Thank you. What may I ask your? Um, so you you are an illustrator. I, I'm sorry. Apparently, so this is a very stupid question. I'm so sorry, and okay, because I missed I missed the previous presentations, which I'm going to watch the YouTube video. So. Yeah, thank you so much.
that that's just wonderful like i really want to keep it yeah thank you yeah please do well i will share it with um uh, lucy and i guess she will share it with you in fact i will put it on uh, social media tonight or tomorrow so you can find it there and I, maybe she can email i wish i had more time to really unpack everything you described but i really like the way you described uh how manga works and how the comic works as a way of taking apart taking all the elements all these specific constituent parts that's really really interesting and Thank i have so um I have this book oh, here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> i'm using so, uh, it a lot and also yeah. the like uh, creating comics i think it, it's uh, that book sequel like oh. this is an understanding comics and there was yeah. like cre creating comics yeah it's brilliant so, it's a brilliant book especially some of the things this these things really stuck in me about how how simplicity and how the levels of detail or simplicity make things more universal or more specific mm -hmm. and how you kind of pull in and out of that mm -hmm. uh, anyway yes i really enjoyed oh, yeah. it so Thank um, you so much. If, if you ever need somebody to um, uh, illustrate for you, uh, just let me know because I'd be delighted to help out. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank right, you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I don't hang out. Bye. Okay. Uh, wait. Do you want to take a screen grab before you do? Yes. 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 You get it?